analyst. Uh, we are going to dive into some of the options that the Bills have to kind of uh, fill out the rest of this roster as we move towards a 2020 season that all of a sudden in a, in a wildly different AFC East has tons of potential for the Buffalo Bills. Chris, how, how are you doing? You, you hanging in there? I'm doing pretty good. And I mean, what's better than talking about the Bills and leading into the draft while we're both social distancing and kind of quarantine in our own houses? Right. So what I'm going to do is I've never done this on Zoom before, but this is a time to try some things out. I mean, we're just kind of all sure. sitting around in our houses and uh, we're going to do a little um, uh, screen uh, share here and see if it works and try to go through the latest CBS Sports uh, mock draft. Uh, when is your next multiple uh, draft uh, round draft coming out? Actually, that's a good uh, plug for you. Next week, I'll have a second or a two rounder and okay. I'm going to do two round mock drafts over the next couple of weeks. Um, until we get to the draft, probably on April 23rd. Awesome, awesome. And you and Chris, if you uh, if you don't follow him on social media, definitely hit him up. What's your uh, Twitter handle? At Chris Trapasso, just my name, and it's T R A P A S S O. Perfect. And also doing a little work on TikTok. So for you young younger folks, get over on uh, download the TikTok app. Uh, he's doing some some player profiles, uh, digging into some of these uh, potential prospects, and all of a sudden, after so much, you know, deep dive on wide receiver early on in the offseason. We're kind of shifting gears here now because the Bills obviously pulled a blockbuster trade for Stefan Diggs last week. And uh, was it two weeks ago now? I mean, all the days are, are kind of yeah. muddled <laughs> together here. But, you know, it's a huge move that completely changes, you know, the team needs and probably what the Bills are looking at with their top selection, which is now number 54. So let me ask, ask you first and foremost, with that move, with Stefan Diggs now a member of the Bills, is it a situation where you still think because of the depth of this class at wide receiver, it's still a position the Bills should address in this draft? Because if you go back to last year, the Bills needed a receiver and ignored the position completely in the draft. Yeah, I think what you just said there makes a lot of sense, that they did ignore that position in the 2019 draft. Um, and this draft class is just so much deeper than that group's was. Certainly with Stefan Diggs, uh, on the Bills roster now, it's not nearly as big of a need. I, I wouldn't really call it a major need, mm -hmm. but fifth, sixth, seventh round, if, if a player that the Bills maybe have graded a few rounds earlier is there, and maybe someone with a little bit more size. I mean, clearly Brian Dable wants wide receivers who specialize in getting open and creating separation, um, but a bigger wide receiver to add that layer to the offense later in the draft would still make sense to me for the Bills. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So um, obviously we're putting this out on YouTube. We'll also put the pod out on, um, we'll put it out in podcast form on Apple uh, and Stitcher. Uh, so you won't be able to see the screen share here, but we'll go through a little bit of what, um, what's happening in this latest mock draft here. And it's a, now do you see it, Chris? The, yep, the I can see it. Yep. So um, we'll just quickly scroll through this first round. I mean, you could talk a little bit about it. I mean, these first 10 to 15 picks, there's probably not going to be a lot of surprises, am I right? I mean, you're probably looking at those four tackles, a couple receivers, a couple of the quarterbacks, and so on. Yeah, I've done a mock draft once a week since the beginning of the college football season. And I've gotten to the point where it's hard for me to put in different players inside the top 10 because it's going to be wide receiver heavy, offensive tackle heavy, and probably three or four quarterbacks um, inside that top 15, 10 to 15. So it's, it's, you could change around which – player goes in to which team but the positions that are the most top heavy offensive tackle wide receiver are going to be picked the earliest mm -hmm. all right so now you saw i scroll through the first round not a lot of surprises like i said we'll go through the second round here cincinnati takes uh oklahoma linebacker kenneth murray uh brandon Ayuk, uh, wide receiver out of asu uh, who's been mocked quite a bit over the last couple months of the bills goes to the colts deandre swift uh running back out of georgia um, goes and, and is that your expectation? I want to ask you about this running back class because it's interesting. Do you do you feel like it's going to be a run on on running backs in the second round, or do you anticipate one going in the first? I don't think any will go in the first. I think with Jonathan Taylor, DeAndre Swift, um, Cam Akers, and J.K. Dobbins, those are the four running backs that could go in the second round. I don't think any others um, will really even be candidates to go there. Um, the only one I could see maybe sneaking in to pick maybe 32 to the Chiefs would be Jonathan Taylor because of his athleticism and his three years of high-level production. But I do think we could see a run. Like if DeAndre Swift goes early in the second round, 
we could see those ball carriers be picked a few selections after him. All right. So let's run through uh, from 40 ish here. Uh, Jalen Rager, uh, Ashton Davis safety. Let's talk about him in a minute. Cause I want to, I want to bring him up with you. Uh, Marlon Davidson to the Jags, Jacob Eason, uh, quarterback to the Chicago bears, Robert Hunt to the Colts, Lucas Nyang uh, to the Buccaneers. Ezra Cleveland uh, to the Broncos. And then we're getting into interesting territory here because I think that this guy right here, Terrell Lewis, edge rusher uh, out of Alabama, he goes at 47 to the Atlanta Falcons. That's a guy that I think most Bills fans are hoping um, falls to 54 and it's a slam dunk pick. What, do you, what is your take on Terrell Lewis? I think he can be one of the best value picks at the edge rusher spot in this draft class. He just dealt with injuries in his career at Alabama, um, was pretty healthy in 2019, but he's like 6'5", 250, 260, has the size, has the length. You like the explosiveness. You just would have liked to see um, more uh, multiple years of high-level production. He uses his hands well. I think he actually has size on his frame to add more weight, um, and his play can be a little bit up and down, but we're talking about an edge rusher, which I still think is a need for the Bills, especially looking into the long term with Mario Addison being older, Jerry Hughes being older. Terrell Lewis, if you can get him at number 54, that's the right value for him. And that would be somewhat of a home run pick for the Bills in the second round. You mentioned uh, team need, and I think that's a – let's kind of take a pit stop here and talk a little bit about that. Where do you rank, you know, what the Bills need? I think the, what Brandon Bean has done a good job of so far this offseason in free agency – is again, filling out the roster, taking care of the, the defensive line. I think that there's a confidence level in the offensive line with bringing back Quentin Spain and not doing a whole uh, heck of a lot else on that offensive line. Uh, a couple of the positions that you know, are, are often mentioned are running back, cornerback. And I, I kind of stand up and, and stand, if you will, a little bit for TJ Yeldon because I think that there's a little bit of more belief in the building for his ability to be that complementary piece to um, – Devin Singletary, then I think fans kind of want to believe. I mean, this is a former, uh, I believe it was second round pick. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. Uh, you know, had a lot of expectations coming out of school and has been pretty good over the course of his career. And he does a little bit of everything. So where do you fall in terms of top, maybe one or two need for the Bills? I still think the biggest need is at that number two cornerback spot opposite Tredavious White. Levi Wallace has been a godsend as an undrafted free agent played very well in his first two seasons relative to, to just not even being drafted. But as we saw down the stretch, and I think we talked about this at the Combine, the Bills lost some confidence in him. He was splitting snaps with Kevin Johnson, right. who the Bills didn't even decide to re-sign. He signed with the Cleveland Browns in free agency. So that, I mean, they did bring in Josh Norman. It's a low-risk proposition. I don't think the Bills are expecting him to be all-pro Josh Norman of 2015. Right. Um, so I think that is still very important, that – being able to pass the football efficiently and stop the pass is the most are the two most important elements um, of any team in today's NFL. So corner, and then probably after that edge rusher, they have some new pieces, but some of them are older. Um, so those would be the two biggest spots. And I don't think um, if you're talking about a number two or a number three running back, um, that just can't be that big of a need to me because the, the value at the position is just not there. You have your feature back in Devin Singletary. You can fill out that number two running back spot with a fourth, fifth, sixth round pick. So I wouldn't really classify that as a major need. If you have one good running back in today's NFL and have someone like a TJ Yeldon and then a late round day three pick, I think you're fine in the modern day NFL. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go back to this uh, draft here. Uh, at pick 48, after Lewis goes off the board, Julian Aquara, uh, edge rusher from Notre Dame, goes off at 48. Uh, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, running back uh, to the Pittsburgh Steelers at 49. Uh, Jalon Johnson, cornerback uh, at 50 to the Bears. If Johnson is on the board and Dantzler, who goes next to uh, the Dallas Cowboys in this mock draft, and then I think – let me just scroll down here. Um, the other guy that I want to uh, – Bryce Hall we could throw into the mix. Mm -hmm. And uh, Arnett. They, wh which one of those four, in a perfect world, if those are all on the board where the Bills pick at 54, who do you like the most of that group? Of those cornerbacks, I have Jalen uh, Johnson actually as like a back end of the first-round talent, just okay. overall what, what he would bring to any team. But in terms of fit in Buffalo, I think Cam Dantzler – 
at six foot two. He's only 190 pounds, has a little bit of shorter arms. He's almost built like a taller version of Levi Wallace, held up very well in the SEC the past couple of seasons. If you watch the Mississippi State LSU game, he's like the only cornerback that really kept Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase in check. I think he's not the best in man, but in zone with his height, um, his physicality, and just his awareness and instincts, I think he could be a, a, a true playmaker. Similar profile to Josh Norman when he was coming out of Coastal Carolina in 2012. Didn't test through the roof, but just the instincts, the zone abilities to make plays. I think Cam Dancer would be the best fit in Buffalo, but Jalen Johnson is the overall better cornerback. He can be man, zone, inside in the slot, press coverage, has good speed down the field, a lot of ball production at Utah. He's the better corner, but the best fit might be Cam Dantzler in round two for the Bills. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so those two um, go off the board there uh, in Johnson and Dantzler, 51 to the Cowboys. And then you're looking at Austin Jackson, uh, who goes off two picks before the Bills. And I, I did a little exercise with uh, one of the draft engines out there, the Draft Network, um, this week, where I kind of did a real-time mock draft with, with, with folks just to kind of get an idea of who's going to be out there. And Austin Jackson was on the board at 54. And that's who, you know, I, I talked through a lot of the options. He, he was the guy that I landed on just because of the upside that he brings, the, the potential position flexibility, and just a – the question mark of Cody Ford still at right tackle on this roster. Where do you land on Austin Jackson? And is he somebody that, you know, if he's there at 54, the upside is too much to uh, ignore? Well, he's getting some first round buzz and I didn't see that on film, but I understand why he's getting that from some of the bigger um, NFL draft insiders, because he checks all the boxes physically. He's got long arms. He's a smooth athlete. He's a young prospect too. So when you're talking about upside, you don't like someone to be a 23 or a 24 year old rookie. He's going to be 21 as a rookie um, with Ty and Seki there. I mean, I think when he's healthy, he's one of the better right tackles in the league, but he's 33 years old. And you're right that Cody Ford did not play particularly well at right tackle this uh, past season, probably best at right guard. So the bills have the bodies on the right side of their offensive line, but I don't think anyone, even John Feliciano is good enough that you're going to say, we're not going to try to upgrade. We don't need to upgrade. And I think if Austin Jackson were there, a few of the corners are gone, a few of the edge rushers are gone, which in this mock draft, it looks like a lot of them are. I would be totally fine with that for the Bills. Probably a redshirt season from him, which if you're thinking about the Bills being in win-now mode, maybe fans wouldn't like that. Maybe it wouldn't be the best value in 2020. But as we get into year four, year five, year six with Josh Allen, um, you do want to have – you know, quality blocking. We saw how big of a step he took in his second season with a much better offensive line. And I think with more strength, Austin Jackson can be a really good left or right tackle in the NFL. Interesting. And, and you bring up Ty Inseki, and it's, it's a good point. I mean, you mentioned, you know, he could be one of the better right tackles if he can stay healthy. He's actually going to turn 35, 35 this season in October, which is you know, it, he's definitely on the, uh, on the wrong side of 30 when it comes to, you know, his kind of the reliability that you can have in him. And, and I was told in Indianapolis by, by somebody I was having a conversation with, they believe that when healthy, he could be even a better left tackle than Deion Dawkins. I mean, that's the kind of skill set that this guy has. But you mentioned the reliability. Is it enough? And, and how much belief do you have in Cody Ford? From my perspective, I thought that there were flashes against some really good pass rushers in 2019 that makes me want to give him a chance to – go at it again in 2020 because of the versatility that you have at some other positions on the offensive line, guys that you have on the roster, because he is going to take such a step from year one to year two. I mean, just going from that Oklahoma um, offense and what they're asked to do on that offensive line, and you can expand on that a little bit uh, as somebody that really breaks down the tape uh, in, in a lot of these offensive schemes at the college level. I mean, from my understanding, he wasn't asked to do nearly as much at Oklahoma as he was being asked to do last year. Probably was like getting hit with a Mack truck uh, at, at times last year. Yeah, I mean, in these air raid offenses, like we see a lot um, in the Big 12, and it's kind of becoming a, an in vogue offense in the NFL today, offensive linemen are asked to block for a lot of run pass options. So they're thinking it's a run play. The quarterback, like a Baker Mayfield, could pull the ball down and throw it. And there's two kind of areas that offense alignment have to kind of be experts in when they're coming into the NFL. Quick setting, where you're almost jumping into the defensive lineman, 
And that's really a, a staple of the air raid offense with Cody Ford did a lot. And then just your traditional kick slide where they're sliding their feet backwards four or five times um, to kind of create that arc to get to the quarterback. Cody Ford did not kick slide very often at Oklahoma. At his size, with his athleticism and his length, he was quick setting into these um, Big 12 defensive linemen much more uh, frequently because the ball was coming out quickly, a lot of run pass options. So I think you're right that he had probably a longer or a steeper <coughs> learning curve um, coming from Oklahoma than most offensive linemen do. And that's probably a big part of why we saw him struggle for most of his rookie season. All right. So back to the mock here and um, with Jackson off the board at 52, uh, Jeremy Chin, who is also a, a Bills Mafia, uh, plugged in Bills Mafia uh, favorite in, in this draft. He goes at, at 53. And one of the, um, I'm not sure if I put out a thing on Twitter and asking for any questions, and I'm not sure if that was what this was. Um, but where do you land on the Jeremy Chin versus Kyle Duggar uh, out of Lenore Ryan uh, in terms of who's going to be the better pro? Because they're, they're kind of getting uh, similarly, I mean, Duggar's been a, a, a favorite for a while now, but Chin is really picking up steam as we move closer to the draft. I think Duggar is the better football player right now, but they're both completely freak athletes. I mean, mm -hmm. at their size, over 6'2", 220 pounds, they tested pretty close to Isaiah Simmons with crazy vertical, broad jump, 40-yard dash. So they are made for the modern-day NFL. I like Duggar more because I saw him in – deep coverage as a safety where he had to range from the deep middle to get to the sideline more often than I saw with Jeremy Chen. I think he's a better run defender. You want to play him as that traditional box safety or box linebacker. Um, but he does flash the ability to range toward the sideline against outside run plays. And you do see some plays in coverage. I think he's just like a half a step behind Kyle Duggar in terms of his NFL readiness, but you would assume in Buffalo, with a head coach like Sean McDermott, with Leslie Frazier. And clearly the Bills want to prioritize that nickel package. They, they hired a nickel coach this offseason um, or kind of moved around some labels and made one of their coaches a nickel coach. They were in nickel 76% of the time last year. That was the third highest rate in the league. You would think that those two coaches in the situation would be able to get the most out of either of these two players. But Kyle Duggar is more ready to be a good pro as a rookie and help you more in coverage than Jeremy Chen. Mm -hmm. Great. Great explanation. So the bills at 54 in this mock draft, Ryan Wilson's, they go with Josh Uche, edge rusher, a uh, Michigan, uh, 6'1", 245 pounds. Um, some other notable names that are on uh, the board here, and we'll discuss uh, which direction you would have went. Uh, Cam Akers, running back, Florida state, LaVisca Chenault, who was maybe a top 15 pick, uh, at, at times last year during the season, he, he falls all the way to pick number 59 to the Seahawks. Jonathan Gr Greenard, uh, edge out of Florida. Ross, Bla Ross Blacklock, a D-line from TCU. Uh, Bryce Hall, cornerback, Virginia. Isaiah Wilson, uh, right tackle, Georgia. Uh, Daryl Taylor, edge. Um, Prince Tega, uh, good luck. Maybe you want to uh, – Want to go. There you go, want to go. Um, <laughs> trying to think other potential Damon Arnett, who I mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, a couple options here, Curtis Weaver edge, uh, Boise state uh, goes in the third round and then Duggar actually goes to the bills at 86 in this, in this um, mock draft. So a, a ton of different options there. Where would you kind of fall with the options in play? Well, of everyone that you just listed that was picked after Curtis Weaver, the edge rusher from Boise state would be the highest player on my board that's not just a bill specific draft board but in general just the best players i believe in this draft class i think it would be curtis weaver i i think he's a first round caliber talent he's big he's 6'3 265 he has an nfl body right now mm -hmm. um very bendy around the edge had a very good combine um dealt with an injury later in the season if you watch some of his later games at boise state november december doesn't look as explosive but he did have a pretty severe ankle injury um, great with his hands and he was productive freshman sophomore junior season like double digit sacks 15 16 tackles for loss I think he would make the most sense for the Bills maybe not um, 
someone who's going to play 70, 80% of the snaps <laughs> with Jerry Hughes, with Trent Murphy, with Mario Addison on the roster. But I think long-term, he kind of reminds me of a bigger version of Jerry Hughes when he was coming out of TCU that Hughes was kind of lower to the ground, one with his speed and his dip around the edge. That's where Curtis Weaver kind of wins. Um, and they both know how to use their hands very well. Um, but to have Jonathan Grenard there too from Florida, um, from Florida, that would be a hard guy for me to pass up on as well because he's similar to Curtis Weaver. He's NFL ready. He has an NFL pass rusher body. And his high level wins um, against SEC tackles look like a first round talent. He's just a little bit inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm banking on Sean McDermott, Leslie Frazier, having a mentor in Jerry Hughes, having another veteran in Trent Murphy, being able to kind of teach some of that inconsistency out of someone like Jonathan Grenard. Again, I think corner's the biggest need, but I think edge is the second biggest need. Um, not that I hate Josh Uchi from Michigan. He's more of a linebacker edge hybrid than mm -hmm. a really, really good pass rusher. Okay. Um, but then to get Kyle Duggar in the third round um, would be a home run for the Bills. I don't think he'll ultimately be there, but if that's how the board fell, you would think the Bills would be very – excited to get him at number 86. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you just got my, my mind racing a little bit to what was at right after there too, was Chase Claypool, which I know is another guy that, you know, in the third round with the way that he tested um, that would be, I think a decision uh, for the bills to have to make, but in terms of another guy that was there that I want to talk a little bit about, because he's another guy that seems like a fit for what the bills want to do on offense. And that's LaVisca Chanel. Uh, who obviously his draft stock has taken an absolute uh, hit with uh, the injury, not really, not really performing at the combine where he wanted to and, and only being able to run. And now he's, you know, obviously with what's going on in society right now, it's probably, you know, better for him because he doesn't have to worry about a pro day or anything like that. But is the upside there with a, a guy that was a month ago, a, a lock first round talent at the, at pick, um, 54. Is that something that you really have to consider if you're Brandon Bean, even with the Stefan Diggs edition? I think you would. Um, that my biggest thing since the combine has been, I don't think LaVisca Chanel is a first round pick, or I don't think he will be just because like you said, the hip injury, um, he had a lower leg injury two years ago, and then he ran four, five, eight. He's six, one and 227. He is a running back playing wide receiver and he is so good after the catch. So first round would be too rich for any team for my blood, but at 54, he's still a relatively young prospect, a true junior. Um, I just for the long-term stability of that offense. And because he's best as a gadget wide receiver as a rookie, you would not need to send him out there and target him 10 to 15 times a game to justify that pick with Stefan Diggs, with Cole Beasley, with John Brown. Use him on end arounds. Use him as a wildcat running back at times. Use him in the red zone. He's a, another running back, an extension of your running game. So if he's there at number 54, although there certainly would be more pressing needs, the value would make a lot of sense for the Bills and just give Josh Allen and his offense more weapons. You mentioned uh, – uh, we'll take some of these Twitter questions too uh, before we get out of here, but you mentioned Weaver as the guy that you'd probably have highest on your board in this scenario. If um, – Terrell Lewis and Weaver were on the board at 54. Where do you land on that? I would still go Curtis Weaver. And okay. that's probably a little bit unpopular, but just I've seen Curtis Weaver. Yes, he was facing Mountain West offensive tackles compared to Terrell Lewis facing SEC tackles, but three straight years of high level production, it, you don't really get that, especially in the second round from someone that does have bend and can win in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. I think Terrell Lewis has similar a similar style that he can win with his length, with his hands, um, but a lot of injury concerns. And you just look at the history of Alabama players, that they're really beaten down by the time they get to the NFL. They practice so hard. They're usually playing 13, 14, 15 games a season. Uh, I just think there's more risk involved with Terrell Lewis. There might be a little bit more upside with him because he is a little longer and might be a better athlete. Um, but I think Curtis Weaver is a safer proposition in the second round if he were there for the Bills at 54. Um, so I'll take some of these questions here. Um, uh, Stu writes, what current Bill slated to start, get a big percentage of snaps, is most at risk of losing playing time based on who you might be able to get in round two or three and why? And I'll let you kick that off. 
Probably uh, Levi Wallace, just because I, I do still think that even with signing Josh Norman, the Bills are in second or third round going to pick a cornerback. And I've said for a long time and written it, there's going to be a lot of cornerbacks in this draft that are similar type players that, that are just going to be all over teams' boards that are going to get picked from like pick 20 to pick 60. I don't think there's a huge drop-off. There's Jeffrey Akuda at the top, Christian Fulton, and then to me there's six or seven cornerbacks that are all between late first round and early third round type of talent. So I think if you're talking about Levi Wallace, who was who came into last season as the starter um, and, and did play a fair amount, I think he's probably still in line and penciled in as the number two corner. But after we see a second or a third round corner, which I would be surprised if the Bills wait until the fourth round to address that spot, uh, Levi Wallace is going to be in a serious cornerback competition in training camp. Uh, additionally, on top of Levi Wallace, who I think is already uh, in some, even without what they do in the draft, I think bringing in Josh Norman uh, really puts some pressure on him. I think Taron Johnson is going to have himself a battle in camp. And I think that, you know, you look at guys like Chin and, and Kyle Duggar, if they're on the roster, then, you know, with a second, third round pick, they're going to be in the conversation to to play quite a bit. And it, it, it's interesting. Taron Johnson is a guy that they like a lot obviously, and, and his mentality and his physicality, the way he plays the game. But he's hurt a lot. And I thought that at times he was a little bit exposed because of his size as a tackler last year. That And I'm, I'm and part of me in the back of my mind as I go back and watch some of the tape, I'm wondering if it's something to do with the lingering um, mindset or lingering thoughts of all of the injuries that he has suffered because of the way that he plays that maybe doesn't allow him to be as effective as he was in year one. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I think Taron Johnson, when he is healthy, like you're saying, is one of the better slot cornerbacks in the league. But it's interesting to kind of go deeper here how the nickel package is evolving right in front of our eyes. That it used to be two corners and then you get that slot corner on the field. He's a starter now. You're playing that 60 to 70% of the times in that formation. But you're right. I think he was exposed in coverage against tight ends and bigger wide receivers. A lot of teams are moving that big slot um, onto the field. And that's why I think the Bills, even for a couple seasons now, have been looking for that big nickel player, that third safety, as opposed to a 5'9", 180-pound slot cornerback. So if you do see two tight end sets or you do see a big slot receiver, you're not at a you know, disadvantage on defense. And I think that's why Kyle Duggar and Jeremy Chin are so highly sought after in this draft class after Isaiah Simmons, because teams want to use that third player, that nickel player now as a safety that has the size to match up with a big slot or a tight end, as opposed to, oh, we have a slot corner that can just face off and can match up well with quick, tiny slot receivers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the next question here is from Brian. Where do you see the cliff for each position? And, and we'll just focus on you know, the ones that we've been talking about here, uh, edge, cornerback, and uh, running back. The range where the talent level drops significantly enough to consider taking while the getting is good. Uh, I think you touched on it a little bit, but would you, would you say that you know, with a couple of these names in play of 54, is it edge or corner where if you don't hit it in the, in the second round, you're going to be taking a significant jump off in, in the third round? I think it, it's edge rusher. And, and that's kind of why, although I've said that I think corner is the Bills' biggest need, edge rusher would make more sense to me in round two. That um, after some of the guys that we talked about, Josh Ucci, uh, Terrell Lewis, Jonathan Grenard and Curtis Weaver that's kind of like tier two or tier three after some of the first round guys after that it's pretty tough sledding at the edge rusher spot I think corner its depth extends out to the third round or fourth round um, so if you're trying to navigate the draft in terms of positional value I think edge would make more sense than cornerback um, but the Bills could go uh, cornerback first because that is to me the bigger need uh, Igb Igb say it. <laughs> I had it in my brain. Noah, Noah Igbenogany. Yeah, it's kind of tough. Igbenogany. Yes. Yeah. Uh, interesting guy that seems his stock seems to be jumping quite a bit. And I also wanted to mention um the safety. Uh, is it Ashton uh, Taylor? Davis. Davis. Yep. Um. So what I like about him, I was reading a little bit about him, and he obviously has some explosive speed as a safety, and maybe some position flex at corner. 
Uh, does he is he somebody that makes sense if he's on the board at fifty four for the Bills, especially because you know how much Sean McDermott and and all of them love guys that can play multi, do multiple things. Yeah, I mean, even with Jordan Poyer uh, recently extended and obviously Micah Hyde on the team, I think Ashton Davis could kind of be that dark horse um, beyond Jeremy Chin and Kyle Duggar, who we've talked about extensively as that big nickel safety, your third safety on the field. He hits like a linebacker, like you said, very explosive. And you saw at Cal, you know, on some teams that weren't very good, he was making plays deep in coverage. He played mostly free safety would play that robber position in the middle of the field where he could freelance a little bit. Um, you could play him at corner as well because he is a good athlete. Um, he could be there and probably will be at number 54 overall. He's dealt with some injuries during the pre-draft process, wasn't able to work out um, at the Senior Bowl or at the Combine. So Ashton Davis is someone, he was a former walk-on, was a track guy at Cal. I think his background and his character, Sean McDermott would like a lot. Um, so he played free safety in college, but I think he could be a candidate for that big nickel position that the Bills clearly want to address in this draft. I like it. All right, we're going to scroll. Before I let you get out of here, those were the, the, the main questions. I'm going to scroll through the rest of this three-rounder. Um, give me a name here uh, once we get to the third round where you would say that if the Bills landed this guy in the third round, you'd think it would be an absolute home run. And you could stop me anywhere here. Um, as we're scrolling down. And if you're listening on podcast, uh, I apologize you're not seeing these names as we go, but I'm not going to butcher all of these names here. <laughs> um, hmm. Past a few, there's Curtis Weaver at 81, which if he's, I mean, that's to me seems very late for Curtis Weaver to the, uh, to the LA or Las Vegas Raiders. There's Kyle Duggar to the Bills at 86. Um, Antonio Gandy Golden, just, I guess you could stop there because there's a few other guys. I, like I said that, that I still think um, that wide receiver should be addressed, that, um, you know, Cole Beasley is not 24 years old. Neither is John Brown. Stephon Diggs is 27. They're all in the prime of their career, so to speak. But I think adding a size element to the offense um, would not be a bad idea. We talked about LaVisca Chenault, who is 6'1", 227, just to add more weapons. I don't think Patrick Mahomes is upset that they have Tyree Kill and Sammy Watkins and Travis Kelsey. Adding more weapons would not be a bad idea. One player earlier in the third round, anyone who follows me on Twitter has heard me rave about this guy or seen me rave um, about him all the pre-draft process. Matt Pert, the right tackle from UConn. He's the guy that tested just absolutely insane, right? He tested through the roof, and he has like an 87-inch wingspan. It was like the second longest at the Combine. Um, he's 6'5", only like 3'10", 3'15". He could add 10 to 15 more pounds. And his film, yes, he's playing in the AAC. So he's not <laughs> facing top competition. Completely dominant. And, and I like the fact for the Bills that he's not a left tackle that you have to move to right tackle. He predominantly played all four seasons as a right tackle at UConn. Awesome pass protector right now. If Ty and Seki, if, they, if they're worried about him, he is 35, like you said. They want to maybe try Cody Ford at right guard, and that's where I think he'll be best. Matt Pert, to me, could come in as a rookie and start at right tackle and give you kind of a tight and sucky type of player who's about 12 or 13 years younger. So